In this video, we're talking all about the position function of a particle. And in this particular problem, we've been given the position function x of t is equal to t cubed minus 6t squared plus 9t. It's called the position function because it models the position of the particle at time t. So for example, if we plugged in t equals 1 and we evaluated the position function at t equals 1, what we would find is the position of the particle after one second. The domain of t is always going to start at 0. So t equals 0 is going to be the start of the domain because, of course, we can't have a value for t that's earlier than time 0. So t equals 0 indicates the beginning of the particle's position, and then the position function traces the path of the particle over time. So it indicates its position. So we can plug in any value for t to figure out where the particle is after that time t. One of the most important things to know about the position function is its relationship to velocity and acceleration. So given the position function, the derivative of the position function will be the velocity function. So x prime of t is equal to v of t, the velocity. And then the second derivative of position, x double prime of t, will be equal to acceleration, a of t. So we take the derivative to get velocity, and then we take the derivative again to get acceleration. We're going to be walking through a lot of questions about the position function. These are just the first two. So the first one here is to find velocity at time t. So first of all, we need to take the derivative of position in order to get velocity. So what we'll say is that x prime of t, the derivative of the position function, is going to be equal to the velocity function v of t. And when we take the derivative of the right hand side using power rule, we'll bring this 3 down in front of the t and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So the derivative of that term will be 3t squared. Taking the derivative of negative 6t squared, we bring the 2 down in front, multiply it by the negative 6 to get a negative 12, and then we'll have t and we'll say 2 minus 1 is 1 for the new exponent. And then the derivative of 9t is just going to be 9. So what we can say then is that the velocity function is given by 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. So if we wanted to find velocity at any time, all we would do is plug that value for time into the velocity function for t. When it's asking us to find velocity at time t, it's just saying model the velocity at any time, which is just the velocity function v of t. So that's all we have to do. Now we're asked to find velocity at specific times t equals 2 and t equals 4. So after 2 seconds have passed, what's the velocity of our particle? Well, we just plug t equals 2 into the velocity function, so we call that v of 2 is equal to, we'll get 3 times 2 squared minus 12 times 2 plus 9. And that's going to be equal to here, 2 squared is 4, 4 times 3 is 12, we get minus 24 and plus 9. So we can say then that v of 2 is going to be equal to a negative 12 plus 9 is a negative 3. We'll come back to this answer in a second, but now let's look at the velocity of the particle after 4 seconds. So that'll be v of 4 is equal to 3 times 4 squared minus 12 times 4 plus 9. And then here we'll get 4 squared is 16, 16 times 3 is 48, minus 48 plus 9. So the result there is v of 4 is equal to positive 9. So what we notice is an interesting thing here. At time t equals 2 seconds, the velocity is negative. At time t equals 4 seconds, the velocity is positive. So one thing to note is when the velocity is negative, it means the particle is moving backwards. When the velocity is positive, it means the particle is moving forwards because velocity indicates direction. So a negative direction means it's moving backwards. A positive direction means it's moving forwards. The next part of the question asks us to figure out when the particle is at rest. Well, when we say the particle is at rest, what we mean is that the particle is not moving. If the particle is not moving, the velocity is equal to zero. So in order to figure out when the particle is at rest, we just take the velocity function we found earlier and we set it equal to zero. So we would say zero is equal to 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And we want to solve this for t, which we'll do by factoring the right-hand side. So if we first factor out a 3, what we get is t squared minus 4t plus 3. And then if we factor 
our t squared minus 4t plus 3, we get t minus 3 times t minus 1. The right hand side is only going to be equal to 0 when one of these two factors is equal to 0. So that means that at t equals 3 and at t equals 1, both of which would make one of these factors 0, then this equation is true. So we can say that the particle is at rest at t equals 1 and t equals 3. And then when is the particle moving forward? What we need to do here is figure out where the velocity function is positive. So we've already factored the velocity function into 3 times quantity t minus 3 times quantity t minus 1. What we need is for this whole expression here to be greater than 0, because that means velocity will be greater than 0, which means the particle is moving forward. Like we talked about earlier, we said that at time 2, velocity was negative, which meant it was moving backwards. And at time 4, velocity was positive, which meant that it was moving forwards. So we need velocity here to be positive. Well, how do we make this left-hand side positive? We either have to have both of these binomial terms here, t minus 3 and t minus 1. They both have to be positive, because then we would have a positive times a positive times a positive. Or they both have to be negative, because then we would have a positive times a negative times a negative. Those two negatives would cancel each other to become a positive. So how do we make both of these terms either positive or both of them negative? Well, if we set t greater than 3, that's the only value that will guarantee this binomial term here, t minus 3, to be positive. Because if you can imagine here, if t is equal to 3, we're going to get 3 minus 3, which is 0. This whole left side will become 0, and we're not going to have a positive value. If t is less than 3, for example, a value of 2, we're going to get 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. We're going to get a negative value for this binomial term, which will force this whole thing to be negative we're going to get a negative value for this binomial term when we want a positive value. So the only way to ensure that t minus 3 is positive is if t is greater than 3. For example, 3.01 minus 3 would still give us 0 0.01. We'd still have a positive value, or obviously any value greater than 3. So if t is greater than 3, let's check the other binomial term. Well, of course, any value greater than 3, if we take away 1 from it, we're still going to have a positive value. So t greater than 3 causes both t minus 3 and t minus 1 to be positive, which will force this whole left-hand side to be positive. So we can say that the particle is definitely moving forward when t is greater than 3. Now, how do we force both of these terms to be negative? Well, we said before that if t was anything less than 3, that this first binomial term t minus 3 would be negative because, for example, if t was equal to 2, t minus 3 would be a negative number. But if t is equal to 2, for this term we get 2 minus 1, we get a positive 1. We have a negative term and a positive term when we need them both to be negative. So this t minus 1 is really the limiting factor here. We really need to make this term negative first. So if we say that t is less than 1, then when we subtract 1, we're going to get a negative value, so t less than 1. For example, if we had the value 1 half, we would get 1 half minus 1 gives us a negative 1 half. So anything less than 1 is going to make this t minus 1 negative. Does it make t minus 3 negative? Well, yes, it does, because anything less than 1, in fact, anything less than 3, would make this term negative. For example, if we took 1 half, we would have 1 half minus 3, we would get negative 2 and a half. Of course, that's going to be negative. So what we can say then is that the particle is moving forward any time when t is less than 1 or greater than 3. So in other words, the only time it's not moving forward is between t equals 1 and t equals 3. The next part of the question asks us to find the total distance traveled by the particle in the first 5 seconds, so between t equals 0 and t equals 5. We just found that the particle is moving forward when t is less than 1 and when t is greater than 3. We already know that the particle is at rest at t equals 1 and at t equals 3. So the particle can only be doing three things. It can be at rest, it can be moving forward, or it can be moving backward. So what we can say is that the particle is moving backward between t equals 1 and t equals 
3. So again, at t equals 1 and equals 3, the particle is at rest. But before t equals 1 and after t equals 3, it's moving forward. Between t equals 1 and t equals 3, it's moving backward. So we have to take that into account if we want to find the distance traveled in the first five seconds. If we think about a number line here in terms of time t, what we can say is that the particle is moving forward on this interval between 0 and 1, that it's also moving forward when t is greater than 3. So forward through this interval here, and then it's moving backward between t equals 1 and t equals 3. We have to take into account its direction when we find distance, and the way that we're going to do that is by plugging in the endpoints of each of these defined intervals, forward and backward, into the position function. So the first interval is from 0 to 1. So what we want to do is we want to take the absolute value of x of 1, the right-hand edge of the interval, and we want to subtract from that x of 0, the left-hand edge of the interval. This is going to give us total distance traveled between 0 and 1. So what we want to do there is we want to plug 1 into the position function. So 1 cubed is going to give us 1. 1 squared is going to give us 1 times a negative 6 is a negative 6. And then 1 times 9 is going to give us a positive 9. Then we're going to subtract from that whatever we get when we plug in 0. Well, of course, here we're going to get 0 minus 0 plus 0. So this is just going to be one big 0 value here. So then 1 minus 6 gives us a negative 5. Negative 5 plus 9 gives us a positive 4. So we get the absolute value of 4, which is just going to be 4. So the distance traveled by the particle between t equals 0 and time t equals 1 after one second is 4. Then we have to take the endpoints of the next interval, which are going to be 1 to 3. So we're going to say absolute value of x of 3 minus x of 1 is going to be equal to, well, we'll start with x of 3. So here we're going to get 3 cubed, which is 27. Here we're going to get 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times negative 6 is a negative 54. And then here we're going to get 3 times 9, which is a positive 27. We already know that x of 1 is this 1 minus 6 plus 9, so we can say minus 1 minus 6 plus 9. When we simplify here, we're going to get 27 plus 27 is 54, minus 54 is 0. Again, we have here a positive 4, but we have this negative sign out in front, so we end up with the absolute value of negative 4, which is just 4. So the particle moves another 4 units between t equals 1 and t equals 3. Then if we do the last interval from 3 to 5, we want the absolute value of x of 5 minus x of 3. And if we plug in 5 to our position function, we get 5 cubed, which is 125. We get 5 squared, which is 25, times 6 is 150, so minus 150. And then we get 5 times 9, which is 45, so plus 45. Then we want to subtract x of 3, which we already found is 27 minus 54 plus 27. So minus 27 minus 54 plus 27. We already know that this value here is 0, so that's going to disappear. 125 minus 150 is a negative 25. Negative 25 plus 45 is a positive 20. So the result there then is absolute value of 20, which we know is 20. So the particle moves 20 units between time t equals 3 and t equals 5. So if we want to find the total distance that the particle travels, we just add these values together, 4, 4, and 20, so we get 28. So the distance from t equals 0 to t equals 5 is going to be 20 units. The next part of the question asks us to find acceleration at time t and then the acceleration at t equals 4 or after 4 seconds. So what we need to do there, remember that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So if we want to find acceleration, what we want to say is that acceleration, which we'll call a of t, is going to be the derivative of the velocity function, which remember is also the second derivative of the position function. So if we take the second derivative of position, 
or just simply the derivative of velocity, we're going to get acceleration. So the derivative here is going to be 6t minus 12. So when we're asked to find acceleration at time t, we're just looking for the acceleration function that models acceleration at any time t, where we leave the variable t inside of our function. So we can go ahead and say that acceleration at time t is going to be equal to 6t minus 12. But then when we're asked to find acceleration at a certain point in time, in this case after 4 seconds, we just plug that value into the acceleration function. So we say a of 4 is going to be equal to 6 times 4, which is 24, minus 12. So that's going to be equal to positive 12. So because acceleration is positive, we know that the particle is speeding up at time t equals 4. So we can go ahead and say that acceleration at time 4 is equal to 12. Now in order to figure out when the particle is speeding up and when it's slowing down, what we need to do is examine the velocity and acceleration functions. What we know is that if the velocity function and the acceleration function are either both positive or they are both negative, in other words, if they have the same sign, then the particle is speeding up. If they have opposite signs, so velocity is negative and acceleration is positive, or velocity is positive and acceleration is negative, then the particle is slowing down. So what we really need to do is indicate where velocity is positive and negative and where acceleration is positive and negative. Remember, velocity is positive when the particle is moving forward. We already said the particle was moving forward at t less than 1 and t greater than 3. So let's pretend that everything above the number line is positive and everything below the number line is negative. Let's also go ahead and say that velocity we're going to indicate in orange and acceleration we're going to indicate in green. So what we can say then is that velocity is positive at t less than 1. So velocity is going to be up here on the positive side at t less than 1. And velocity is going to be positive at t greater than 3 because these are the points at which the particle is moving forward, which tells us that velocity is positive. But velocity is negative because the particle is moving backwards between t equals 1 and t equals 3. So this is sort of a visual indication of how velocity is behaving. What about acceleration? Well, we have the acceleration function here. a of t is equal to 6t minus 12. So we're interested in knowing where this function here is less than 0 and where it's greater than 0. Well, if we just take 6t minus 12 and we say 6t minus 12 and we want to set that greater than 0, we would add 12 to both sides and we'd say 6t greater than 12. We divide both sides by 6 and we would say t greater than 2. So at t greater than 2, acceleration is positive. What about if we set the acceleration function less than 0? If we say 6t minus 12 less than 0, we add 12 to both sides to get 6t less than 12, and we divide both sides by 2 to get t less than 2. So acceleration is positive when t is greater than 2. So acceleration is positive. We'll graph it on the positive side of the number line. And then acceleration is negative when t is less than 2. So we come down here and we put acceleration on the negative side of the number line. So now what we have to do is look at each interval and say whether or not these lines are on the same side of the number line or on opposite sides of the number line. So for example, between 0 and 1, velocity and acceleration are on opposite sides of the number line. Velocity is positive, acceleration is negative. Because they have opposite signs, we know that the particle is slowing down. So let's go ahead and say slowing down here and speeding up. So we know that the particle is slowing down for everything less than 1. So this is going to be t less than 1. What about here between 1 and 2? Well, acceleration and velocity are on the same side of the number line. They're both negative. Since they have the same sign, we know that the particle is speeding up. So between 1 and 2, so we can say 1 less than t less than 2. On that interval, the particle is speeding up. Between 2 and 3, acceleration and velocity are on opposite sides of the number line. They have opposite signs, so again the particle is slowing down. So we can say 2 less than t less than 
3. And then from 3 on, greater than 3, acceleration and velocity are together. The signs are both positive. So we can say that for t greater than 3, the particle is speeding up because both velocity and acceleration are positive.